All righty, I think that we are good to go and live. Uh, I have Jen with me today. Today we're going to have a very interesting topic. Uh, so definitely want to go ahead and welcome everyone who's tuning in and kind of say hello. So like you saw in the previous uh, message, one of the things that we like to do is say, hey, uh, let us know kind of, you know, your branch of service uh, when you were in. Uh, things like that. So we'd like to definitely, you know, recognize you and thank you. So uh, while we get some comments here going and people start tuning in, um, I wanted to just introduce my guest. So Jen, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, we'll start kind of going from there. Okay. Well, my name is Jen Baumgartner Barnes and uh, I'm in Minnesota right now, having just moved here from Colorado, um, where I was living with my significant other, um, who is in the Air Force. He's a chief um, and is a loadmaster, C-130 loadmaster. Um, I think he's got like 24 years in now. <laughs> so uh, yeah, he's currently reservist. Um, moved back to Minnesota to be with my family. Um, I am a licensed clinical social worker and I have my small private practice here. So that's exciting. Um, I get to, it's exciting to be closer to family. I spent the weekend up at the cabin. So that was fun. Um, I have a a cool connection to military. Um, I worked as an army civilian for a while uh, at Fort Carson in Colorado Springs. Did the MFLAT gig for a bit. Um, but also my dad was in the Air Force during the Vietnam era, uh, packing parachutes <laughs> back home. And my grandpa actually was in the Navy, fought in the South Pacific during World War II. So um, lots of connection to military. So I'm really excited to be on this call. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, one of the things we like to do when we kind of start, um, kind of kicking off here is we like to do a quick, um, roll call of sorts, right? So yeah. let, let's see who's here. So we have Sean, um, joining us, ready to roll, uh, U.S. Okay. Army Infantry 9199, one of our coaches. Thank you for your service. Cool. Uh, Jamie, uh, Teobart, thank you for your service. Uh, okay. Rick, uh, from West, be uh, by by God, Virginia, awesome. <laughs> Mark says aloha from Honolulu, USMC oh, ninety aloha. to two thousand one. Oh, mahalo you for your service, mahalo. <laughs> uh, let's see, hello from Ohio, U.S. Army retired. Right. Uh, let's see, howdy from the big uh, wave, Flint, Michigan uh -huh. house. Uh, <laughs> you might know this person here saying hello. Lisa. Oh, I know Lisa. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> Rick, uh, retired uh, Air Force Loadmaster, 72 Oh, Loadmaster. Thank right. you for your service. There you go. Uh, let's see. MG Steel, um, B Recess. Thank you, DP and Jen. Appreciate you, my brother. Um, Ashley, 90 to 95. Combat Craig says, boom. We have Kevin here, 98 to 07. Thank you for your service, Kevin. Willie, thank you for your service. Uh, Tim, yeah. appreciate you for being here. Uh, Blue Corps Patriot says, thank you, DP. Thank you for your service, brother. Uh, oh. Jeff Lynch, 2007 to 2011. Um, hey, awesome. <laughs> we got Craig. Combat Craig is into his house. Uh, <laughs> Mary says, what's up, team? Um, and someone, um, uh, let's see, Dwayne, 8692. So a bunch of them. As we go forward, we'll definitely wow, uh, yeah. keep sharing oh, it. Sorry, but we definitely want to, um, you know, kind of uh, highlight that as we kind of go forward. So. Um, yeah, welcome. One of the big things uh, that we kind of wanted to begin talking about today, um, especially with the current, um, you know, state of events, right? What's happening in the world and what right. we're dealing with. Um, you have worked specifically with both veterans and regular trauma victims. And it's it comes to us no surprise that we're dealing um, in a space where individuals are not going out. So I can speak from a point of view as a PTSD uh, rated, you know, veteran that leaving the house or staying in the house is definitely not a, um, a punishment. So I can definitely relate to wanting to stay in social isolation and all that. It's definitely not uh, a difficult thing for many of us. So one of the things that we kind of talked about is really social isolation for trauma victims. Um, and I think it's very helpful for many because many of the veterans um, and individuals that we work with and talk to, they literally have dealt with, um, you know, different um, types of uh, 
therapies or they've tried different things uh, they've reached out to us they filed a claim they've got to a place where maybe now they know that they're dealing with something so in turn now they're looking at how to go about um, you know continuing that journey and then this happens and now you're stuck back in the house and for many you could regress so talk to me a little bit about social isolation uh, as it relates as a whole and then really we'll start narrowing down uh, for veterans specifically uh, because again just to give some context many of the people we deal with just finally have come to the realization that I have a mental health condition and then now right. I'm going to get therapy and help so not only do I file a claim or get help with that but now I'm actually going to go to the process of getting the assistance I need and then COVID happens and now many people are not using telemedicine they don't have the ability to reach out. They feel like, you know what, I'll get back to this later. And it's like you're almost rehabbing mentally and emotionally and psychologically and then stunt that growth. So talk to me a little yeah. bit about social isolation uh, from your perspective and then we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, so DP, what I'm seeing is, is you know, certainly a range of responses. Not everyone's responding exactly the same, which we would expect. Um, you know, there are some of my complex trauma survivors who, um, who are definitely um, struggling, and that's probably the majority. Um, they're, they're struggling because, like, they're loving this. <laughs> and the struggle is that at some point they're going to go back out there. But right now they're, like, living their best life at home, right? I mean, what seal feels like it, because they're like, well, I'm not really having many symptoms, and because they're not coming into contact with things that would normally trigger them. Right. And so there's a lot of that. There are people who, especially those with more of, a, um, you know, more what looks like depression kind of symptom set that are actually doing much worse. Um, like their symptoms are being exacerbated because the thing that helps their depression is to get outside and be around people, even though they don't want to. That's typically what we recommend and what they find us helpful. So they're struggling. But a lot of my my clients with social anxiety disorders um, PTSD, complex trauma, all those things are like, oh, finally, I don't have to go out and be around those people. But then we're talking long term, that's really problematic. Um, because it's just more, it's, it's instilling this idea of, oh, I shouldn't be around people. It's not safe to be around people. I'm going to hole up by myself, right? So we're seeing an exacerbation of symptoms or what will be when they have to return to the world <laughs> so uh, one good comment came up here jen we are loving it this is yeah. our normal um yeah. so uh, to, to your point it, it really kind of speaks to the fact of getting to a place of understanding that the way i kind of rationalize again you know i'm you know we'll, we'll preface this from the beginning uh to, to really talk about the fact that though jen uh, and we'll share her information as well, is a licensed therapist dealing with trauma and different modalities. Uh, this doesn't substitute in any shape, fashion, or form uh, medical advice. Uh, this is an information conversation. So we want to emphasize that this is more awareness of the different things that we have got to and ultimately trying to get to the point of saying, go out there and reach for help, right? If you see something today, we talk about a different modality of therapy, uh, look into it, right? Find a therapist, go to the VA, go to the vet center, find something that works for you. Uh, but in no shape, fashion, or form should this be construed to be uh, medical advice. It is information that hopefully you can then take that and have a conversation with your medical provider. So, you know, a quick disclaimer in that regard. Um, so what I would say from my perspective, looking at it from a veteran uh, side of the house, um, it's hard enough to come to the point of actually having this conversation. It's hard enough to be able to come to the realization that we're dealing with mental health conditions. Enter now the current state that we are operating in um, of being secluded, right? So like, you know, the uh, Blue Cord Patriot mentioned, um, it's our new normal. It's our normal, right? There is nothing new for us, right? We can literally live of not leaving, leaving the house. We can live in a place where Uber Eats brings us what we want, Amazon brings us what we want, and we have no interaction whatsoever. However, what would you say about, let's say, a veteran, right, or a patient, anyone who's dealt with trauma, who finally comes to the point of saying, Jen, you know what? I realized that after 20, 30 years, the person that I am, right, did not come back the same from Vietnam. I thought, yeah. you know, that everything was fine, but the reality is I've held on to trauma from the 70s, from the 60s, right. some even the 50s. And your entire, you know, existence from that point to now 
it's a facade of who you were. People know you to be a thing. Um, and one of the examples that I had shared with you before is I used the limp example. Um, you know, if I were to be hit by a right. vehicle and I walk with a limp, you'd say, well, you know, DP got hit by a vehicle and that's why he walks with a limp. Right. From a mental health perspective, though, what ends up happening is we deal with trauma and we don't realize it. So now I walk through the world thinking I am a limp. I am the limp. Where in mm -hmm. reality is, you know, from a physical perspective, I, I, I kind of rationalize and separate to understand that, no, though I live with this limp because of what happened, it doesn't define me. And now I begin to work to be able to get around life and transverse things and do things. So from a mental health perspective, a similar thing happens. Uh, and in my own journey, what I've kind of come to the realization of is understanding that I am not PTSD. I have not major depressive disorder. Mm -hmm. I am not generalized anxiety disorder. I am not those things, though I deal with them, though they recur and I manage them and I try to do the best I can day to day. Uh, it's something I deal with and live with. That said and done, now the journey of kind of getting to a place uh, of learning to balance that. Like in my case, we, I shared with you, I have a a service dog in training that um, we're graduating here within a month yeah. or so. Um, and even having those conversations, right? Um, you know, for those that may have not heard, you know, we'll talk about service dogs another day, but one thing I will share is it was a conversation I had to have with my family. And by my family, I mean my kids, like literally telling my kids, <coughs> this is not the family puppy. This is not the family dog. This is uh, for dad because of PTSD. What is PTSD, right? And at the time, the eight-year-old's like, do well, I have PTSD? You know what I mean? And trying to have that conversation that, you know, you begin to have awareness. So all that to say that coming to the point from a mental health perspective of this is not what defines me, but that's further along in the journey. For many of our folks, it's literally coming to the realization that for the past 20, 30 years, our, you know, my wife, my kids, my niece, my nephew, so forth, don't know who I truly am. Um, and many right. veterans have been dealing with that like no one knows bob pre-1972 they know bob after 72 and the reality right. is that bob was you know the life of the party sandra was you know the funny you know joke cracking person and now they're this shell so today they come to realize that i am dealing with these things i'm working through it so the impact of social isolation for many can stunt it because i cannot regress and go back and ignore what i know now so what would you say, and I, I mentioned all that to say that, again, if we're looking at our, at, our, at, our, at, our, at our veterans being in this state, what would be the impact and how would you begin to articulate working through social isolation when you have someone that now can't go back, right? Because I can say, hey, Jen, you know what? Forget this PTSD thing. I'm going to go back to where I came from. Everything is right. fine. What, right. what would you, what would, what's your take on that? Again, that's my personal thesis from your yeah. perspective professionally. What's, what would you say in your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you know, DP, you make a really, a really good point, which is that, um, you know, when you first come home and, and, and maybe even first exit from the military, you haven't fully embraced the, the PTSD um, diagnosis, right? And, but then once you start to, and you go to therapy, you start to like open that wound, right? You start to open that and, and start to realize like, oh, you know, I do have these symptoms. I do struggle with that. And again, to your point, that's not who you are. It's just something that shows up in your life that can be challenging, right? That doesn't work for you. Um, no one asked for it. It's not who you are. Um, but the reality is it's there. But once you see it's there, it's hard to go back and be like, zip it back up and be like, nope, I don't, I don't have PTSD. I'm just, I'm DP pre-military, Right. And it's just, it's not that simple because you've had these experiences that have had an impact on you, right? And our nervous systems naturally take that on. Like, it's not something that you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to do all these things, you know, in, in your case in the army and I'm going to be fine. But well, that's not our choice, right? Our nervous system does that for us. Um, and, and so the reality is, is when we are in this social isolation thing and, and we, we, sh you know, we have an opportunity to shut down. It's important that we try not to, right? Because, um, it would be really easy. Like you said, um, like people have been saying in the chat box, like this is our normal. We know how to do this, this social isolation thing, having, you know, people bring me my food and use an Amazon prime and all that, that feels really safe. And of course it feels safe because you're not interacting with, you know, people in the outside world who don't get it, you know, who maybe don't understand what, what you've been through. Um, 
And that's great that that feels safe, but long term, it actually just makes it a longer healing process because now we're compounding that already existing desire to isolate and to stay in a sense of safety, right? To stay behind the wire, right? right? Um, and, and the problem with that is, is now that you've started treatment, it's really important to continue, to find ways to continue, whether it's telehealth or, you know, there's some really great, great groups that you might be able to find of veterans that are even talking with each other, maybe not even a therapist, but you're just even finding people to connect with so that you're not finding that same level of regression that you would if it was just you and your dog, right? So, so uh, yeah. Brian, I, I hear your brother appreciate you. So I, I, let me know if you're able to hear me a little bit now. Um, I had Jen uh, turned up all the way. My mic was a little bit low. Um, so give me a thumbs up, brother, if you hear me. So uh, see you loud and clear here, brother. Appreciate you. Um, so to that point, though, of kind of coming to that realization, what would you say to the, you know, that the blow to the ego, right? Oh, the, right. Because there's a point we've stressed on here, which is DP is not the pre-military DP. And the fact is that many veterans we work with truly are, you know, thinking to themselves that they're still mentally, right, that 17-year-old um, who got drafted. Um we are technically, uh, you know, the individuals that went into service at a certain time, right? Um, I don't have right. these limitations. I can do this, right? And we're going to talk about some modalities and stuff. And you know, one of the big things that we talked about, for example, was yoga and, you know, like boot camps and things like that. So when you look at, for example, um, different um, um, options that are out there, for example, like me, I have no interest whatsoever in um a, a boot camp session like at a ymca <laughs> right because i've been there right. done that so i'm not attracted by all these things but at the same token i'm not interested in something that's for a disabled person either right so it's like that weird thing where my ego and my mind says i can do a thing but the reality is i cannot do a thing right and we'll talk a little bit about some options that are available uh but i think that the, the blow to the ego of being able to put that to the side and saying i do need to get this help uh, one of the things I think is very crucial about this conversation, while it might not be the glitz and glam, uh, it's trying to create a safe space for individuals to be able to talk about this. Because one of the things that has been shared and I've heard with many of the veterans that we've worked with, that I've worked with personally, has been, I came back from Vietnam, went to the BFW, went to the American Legion, and it was a peacocking, you know, situation, right? All you right. think you got it bad there? You know, let me tell you about Korea. You think I had a bad day? Let me tell you about, you know, World War II. Fast forward, now the guy from Iraq comes back, or the gal from Iraq comes back, and the guy from Vietnam or gal from Vietnam says, do you think you had a bad? Let me tell you about what happened to me when I was in Vietnam. And it becomes this comparison, you know, rivalry thing that's almost organic to us, right? Go Army, beat Navy. We're better than, you know, it's all this thing that we have, but when it comes to the mental health and can, looking at a disability and being true to coming to get help, uh, that has to be put aside. And I can tell you that I've talked to veterans, 50, 60, 70 year old who have literally said, you know, DP or many of our coaches here, this is the first time I've actually talked about this. When I came back, I went to the places I should have gone. But when I was there, nobody wanted to hear about my stressor as a cook, my stressor or event as an mm -hmm. admin person. Um, can you talk about trauma? Because one of the things I'm very big on is saying mm -hmm. trauma is trauma is trauma. If I yes. experienced trauma when I was repelling from a helicopter mm -hmm. doing things or a Navy SEAL did this or a cook was, you know, a subject to an IED or a veteran stateside at a base where everything should have been fine doing an admin work was military had, was exposed to military sexual trauma or physical trauma. Regardless of what's happening, can you talk about the psychological reaction? Because we tend to say, you know what, Jen, I don't have it as bad. I came back with four limbs. I'm a little screwed up, but some have it worse, so I'm fine, right? Someone yeah. else did something worse. And we keep going through the whole process of someone else, someone else, someone else. And my, my, my philosophy has always been trauma is trauma is trauma. Your symptoms are your symptoms are your symptoms. And that goes beyond a disability claim. That's just getting care. Uh, but from your perspective, because you deal with trauma specifically, what would you say to that piece? Yeah, DP, I think that's a really great point. Um, 
so we talk about, you know, trauma is trauma, right? Like it's, it's all relative to what your experience was. And, and actually in trauma therapy, we talk about big T traumas, like big T versus little T traumas, right? And little T trauma doesn't mean it's less. It just means it might be something that if you shared with someone, oh, this is my trauma, they might not automatically go, oh yeah, that sounds really traumatic. Where a big trauma might be you were in a convoy and got blown up in a Humvee. Um, And if you told that story, everyone would be like, oh yeah, that's fucked up, man. Oh, sorry. I don't know if I should swear. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. You know, so everyone would notice that as trauma, but the thing is, is your nervous system doesn't know the difference between the two. So I have people that come in who have lost limbs or, you know, have been gone through rape or military sexual trauma in the case of veterans. Um, and, and yeah, that's trauma. And when we ask like, um, something we use in therapy is a subjective unit of distress. So on a scale of zero to 10, how, how distressing is this for you? They're like, Oh, 10 out of 10, right. Or nine out of 10. Or sometimes people are like, I don't know. It's like a six, but someone else might rate that as a 10, right? But then we have people who may have had the experience of, of um, parents who withheld love um, when they felt disappointed. So I had a client who would come in and um, one of her traumas, and this is a little T trauma, but it's still, um, she's like, you know, when I would get an A minus, my dad, I'll take my glasses off, would go like this. And for her, that was a 10 out of 10. Now, that's a little T trauma because probably there's some of you who are like, oh, that's not trauma. But for her nervous system, that felt unsafe because if her dad was judging her like that, her her whole nervous system was like, oh, I don't know. Like, are they going to get rid of me? Will I have a home tomorrow? I'm not good enough. Right. And so and the same is true with people who, you know, DP, you mentioned like cooks in the military. Right. Or um, people who maybe did something in a chair in an office, you know, yeah, they were behind the wire, but maybe they were in Djibouti or cutter, um, you know, and they were behind the wire the whole time. That doesn't mean their trauma is any less real. It's just all relative. And so the comparison, while I understand like, yeah, so much of that comparison is what helps you thrive during your service, right? You're trying to achieve a next rank. You're trying to You know, um, you know, you're comparing cabs, right? Like who has a combat action badge and, and, and all that. Um, but now that you're out, my hope is that we can find like, y'all went through this very, very similar stuff. Your experiences were very different, but your nervous systems experienced a lot of the same. So, um, yeah. So again, uh, I think YouTube finally kind of kicked in here. So this will be replayed again for those that kind of tuned in here. Uh, towards the end. So we're live on uh, Brian Reese's Facebook page. We're live in um, my Facebook page. We're live in Brian's uh, YouTube channel and my YouTube channel. So we're streaming in different locations. This will again be reposted in its entirety, uh, but looking at social isolation uh, for trauma victims to include veterans, obviously. Um, And we're kind of discussing some of that. So thank you for everybody kind of tuning in. Definitely feel free to type in uh, your service. So again, we'll take a quick pause and say, uh, thank you all for your service. Uh, Jeffrey says, hello, DP and Jen. Mike check from Alex. Uh, John, thank you uh, for tuning in. Uh, Eugene, thank you for your service up in YouTube land. Uh, we appreciate you uh, tuning in and joining us here today. Um, Lisa said, uh, we love it, Jen. All purpose word for sure. Um, <laughs> and then many other things. And we'll kind of show this. So Jen actually also shared uh, a, a article that you wrote and we'll link that as well. So that's c- coming your way here also. So you can take a look at that. But going back to this piece here, one of the things that stands out to me uh, is looking at this from the warrior perspective, right? What exactly is happening when someone is trained to do a thing, right? You don't admit defeat. You don't leave a man behind. You suck it up and you drive on, right? You, you know, there's not there's showing of no weakness. Right. You don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the guy who can't do the mission or do a thing. So fast forward to this situation here. Now, um, what we're looking at is now coming to a place where that's not who I was. Right. One of the things I encountered initially in in therapy was coming to the point of that my best days are behind me. 
Is that something you've seen dealing with trauma patients, dealing specifically with veterans, uh, that many of them feel like, you know what, Jen, what's the worth, right? And that then begins the pathway of leading yeah. into, you know, issues for some where, you know, suicidal ideations might become a thing. And again, there's a gamut of that, but really right. looking at, you know, Jen, what's the worth, right? My best days are behind me. Yeah what's ahead of me, you know, I can't do the things I used to do. I'm dealing with these uh, limitations, both physically and psychologically. You know what, why not hang it up, right? I should have just never came back from where I was and what have you. Um, what would you say to those individuals, right, um, who have to understand how to navigate that, right? We're not saying that you're weak, again, to the limp example. If someone is hit by a vehicle, they have a limp. They are not the limp. They were hit by a vehicle. You can get therapy. Yeah. You can get better. You may not regain full momentum and full functionality, but that doesn't mean you cannot develop new skills, right? So yeah. can you talk a little bit about, you know, coming to a place of understanding that while I'm not the version of what I used to be, that doesn't limit what I can be, right? And that's going to be a good right. segue into therapy because for many, though you had some great days behind you, uh, that doesn't, you know, negate what's ahead of you. Right. If you look at all the greats in life, they've done something. Uh, many of them create some of their best masterpieces, works of arts, inventions, businesses later on in life, well into their, you know, 50, 60, 70. Um, as long as there's breath in your lungs, as long as you're able to, you know, think and do a thing, uh, you can create, you can do, you can bring value. Right. There's someone out there that needs a help. Right. There's, you know, you might not feel like you can't do certain things. But even sharing a story like this, being able to reach out into someone's life and say, hey, been there, done that. I know what that dark well looks like, because this is a holistic thing where it's not just the therapy from a therapist. It's also looking at you need a community to be able to get to a place of us even getting help. Um, so can you talk a little yeah. bit about the ego aspect of being able to kind of move into, you know, a place of understanding that <coughs> though, while my best days as of today are behind me. How do I now begin the process of moving forward, right, uh, into a right. new reality, into a new me uh, from a trauma perspective? Because it's that mentality of, you know, those things are behind me. Right. Well, and I want to speak to, I just really want to validate, DP, how, for, for all you, um, that it, it is really common to not want to ask for, for help. You know, I um Certainly a lot of the service members I worked with when I was an Army civilian, but also as an MFLAC, and then since then in my private practice, um, you know, asking for help isn't something you do when you're in a combat zone. <laughs> you got your, 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 your battle buddies. Um, it's, it's unsafe to ask for help. It's unsafe to show weakness. And certainly our nervous systems are designed that way, right? Like our fight or flight response, you know, if we have a tiger chasing us, we don't show the tiger that we have a limp. <laughs> Right. Because then the tiger's like, oh, this is the weakest link. Right. Like, I'm going to eat this guy, you know, or gal. And um, and so, like, yeah, absolutely. I get that. And that's the mindset when you're in danger. And so I think some of that shift is mm -hmm. is recognizing that, like, OK, now, like, how can we help our nervous systems mm -hmm. realize that they are safe enough that the tiger's not still chasing you. Now, can, now I want to stop you there because I think that's yeah. a very key point there when we look at yeah. PTSD now. So looking yep. at PTSD, what many yep. folks don't understand is what's happening psychologically. It's that fight or flight, you know, response that mm -hmm. arguably it's jaded, right? It's like the switch is turned on and it's literally stuck on on. There it is no, on. you know, like cause it, most things like you react, right? Am I in danger or am not? Do I fight? Do I flight? You know, what's the situation? If that's not something present at the moment, right, we mostly, all things considered, know when to, you know, start a response or do a thing. When you've been in a place, like to your point as a veteran, where, yes, right, you're in the wild, you're dealing with these things. Um, uh, uh, one fun fact is, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen The Office, the, the show. Oh, yeah. So I love The Office, and Dwight has a saying where he says something to the effect of, in the wild, you know, uh, you know, there is no healthcare in the wild. It's, oh, I'm hurt. Someone eats me. And that's all she wrote, right? Like live, you know, life, life or death. And one like African proverb that I remember distinctively is that, you know, at the end of the day, when the sun goes up in Africa, you know, either if you're a lion or you're a gazelle, you better be running, right? So that's what happens. Yeah. And for many of us, right, when you look at it, we've been programmed in a place where, you know, multiple combat tours, being exposed in a place where you're always thinking, is the day the day something happens? I remember the first day, I kid you not, in Iraq, 
phone alarm, if you have an iPhone, it goes like, bam, 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 bam. And the first day there, uh, if Jose is listening to this, one of my battle buddies, uh, I have my alarm set and it goes off. And I tell you, I freak out everyone in the tent because the alarm on the iPhone is the same alarm for incoming. So, of course, it's just like, you know, everybody's kind of fretting and I'm just like, what is happening? I'm just trying to get up early and do something, right? So, fast forward, get to a place where, you know, that becomes a thing. So, when I hear the alarm the first, you know, couple of weeks, a month, whatever, incoming, you're going to the bunker, you're doing a thing or whatever the procedure is. Towards the end of it, it's literally such a desensitized thing where the alarm goes off. It's like, all right, got to get some food now. And people are just walking down like nothing's happening. And you can almost tell who's new in a combat, you know, or contingency environment or base because you can tell who's just kind of looking at like if today's the day is going to happen. Because it could happen when I'm sleeping. It could happen on the convoy. It could happen on the chopper ride. But being in that place where you're always in that heightened level of awareness, it becomes your new norm. And to the point of the PTSD, it's balancing that whole thing of, how do you now recalibrate that from, okay, we're not in this capacity, right? The mailbox is not going to come and attack you. But for many, it's literally like from here to the mailbox, it is an operation to get there and do something because I'm right. thinking of all the possible worst case scenarios and people are living in that conundrum. Add social right. isolation, it almost kind of validates a lot of that for people because now it's like, oh, wait a second, there's a pandemic my fight or flight response doesn't look at, you know, old mask and cover and hygiene. It's no, 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 there's a threat and it can take me out. So negative Ghost Rider. Um, can you talk a little bit uh, about that point that you've seen? Because I, I think it, it's very poignant to understand the dynamics of what really is happening psychologically for PTSD. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, DP, you, you've got you, you hit the nail on the head. It's really that. the So and this actually let me back up. One of the things that a lot of us trauma therapists don't like about the diagnosis PTSD is the D stands for disorder. And the only reason that this is a disorder is because essentially all those skills that you need in combat to stay safe are just continuing when, when you technically no longer need them. Like you've gotten stuck in your fight or flight response, right? But take away, take away your current environment and put yourself back in trauma Hypervigilance is a good thing when you're back in combat. Being easily startled is a good thing when you're in combat. Not trusting that other people are safe is a good skill to have in combat, right? Like all, a lot of the symptoms of PTSD are things that actually help you when you're in it. They're only a disorder because now you're, you're hopefully not in it, but your nervous system doesn't get that. So your nervous system is still stuck in that fight or flight response, or sometimes right? Like you use the example of a gazelle and a lion, right? If you're a gazelle being chased by a lion, eventually you, your nervous system can't fight or flee anymore. So it, in the animal kingdom, we call it playing dead. It freezes. It shuts down. This looks like depression and dissociation in humans, right? If you've ever seen National Geographic, you watch the gazelle lay there um, looking dead when in reality, all it's done is its nervous system is shut down. So you're not feeling emotional or physical pain. Right. It's a state of numbness. So because which is good if you're going to be eaten alive by a lion, it's good to feel numb. Right. So you might see that aspect of it, too. But both of those are very common with what we refer to as PTSD. The cool thing is, and this is where the hope comes in, kind of to speak to your last question is, why do I keep going on? Why bother? Which I want to validate. Like, I totally get that. Um, not that I'm like encouraging you to go down that path, but I get why your your system would go there. Because this is hard. No one told you when you signed up when you were 17 that this was a good possibility of feeling this way. And the good news is, is we have a lot of really awesome treatments now that actually can help you feel more like a sum of your experiences in a positive way. You know, like, like DP's organization that you work, work for is veterans helping veterans. I can't do that work. I'm not a veteran. I mean, yes, okay, I'm uh, sort of a military spouse. We weren't married but um, for 10 years, but, but I can't do the work that you do, you know? And so there's so much that our veterans can do. I was talking to someone today whose spouse, actually, he's going to be retiring out of the military soon, and he's able to do these really cool opportunities that a civilian can't do. Um, but first things first, we want to help you with some of these treatments to help you heal. And, and that's, right? that, that's powerful uh, because, mm -hmm. um, again, we have so many comments coming in. Uh, 
Blue Corp Patriot, my psych said to me that PTSD is not a disorder. It is normal reaction to abnormal Bingo. situations. Um, again, I know you just said it, but say it one more time for the people in the back who didn't hear it. Um, you know, PTSD is not a disorder. It is a normal reaction to abnormal situations. And just like many of us, you know, again, correct me if I'm wrong or you can add to this, but I would, I would, I would venture to say and offer to those listening and seeing this, wherever you might be, you didn't know how to use an M16. You didn't know how to use a rifle. You didn't know how to do a lot of the things that you went ahead and did, you know, for God and country when you served, the jobs you did, the, you know, being a cook, being infantry, being a ranger, all those skill sets that you acquired, you learned them. I showed up as a 17 year old kid thinking I could do everything and I learned very quickly from my drill sergeants that I could not. And I was molded and broken and built and, you know, did a thing. But now in this effort, it's the same. Right. We turned on a thing and now going back to the regular world, transitioning, whether or not you did four years, whether or not you did 12 years, whether or not you did 20 years, regardless of the time you did. Trauma can be trauma. Things you deal with are things you deal with. And it's a new skill set that you must learn to use. Right. So a lot of the questions that are coming up here uh, are interesting. Uh, Jonathan, for example, shared from YouTube. Uh, VFW Post Service Officer, uh, appreciate you for your service here, brother. Thank you for joining us today. Um, uh, one veteran said here, I'm service connected for PTSD, uh, feeling like something is wrong, but I don't know what part of PTSD. I'm still waiting on the answer from my therapist. Um, and that really yeah. kind of goes to the point of this is a journey. This is something where, and, and that's why it's a good segue. And you see the link here. If you want to reach out and kind of reach out to us, you got vaclaimsinsider.com, join vaci.com. You, you can reach out to us, message us here below, um, and we can get in detail as far as the uh, claim side of the house, but the therapy part is what really creates it, right? Being able to understand that I now understand what I have to better articulate how it is disabling to me. Um, uh, Jen's link here is shared. I just want to kind of pop over there very quickly to show it to uh, everyone to kind of see what we have here. So uh, here we have uh, Jen's page. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about kind of what we have here and uh, some of the services? Yeah. Uh, available. So I'm just kind of, you know, this is the background yeah. for those that want to check you go, it. There's a services page. Yep. There you go. Go to that. Yeah. So a lot of what I offer are the treatments that I can share about today. Um, EMDR, if you're not familiar, stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Um, it's a, it's a great therapy. It can be, it can be pretty harsh sometimes because what you're doing is um, first you're, you're creating a sense of stabilization. So you and your therapist would work on um, learning some skills to help you deal with like the day-to-day -day stuff, right? Like, like when you're getting triggered or how to get grounded or if you're depressed, how, you know, what things can help that. Um, and then you actually are doing reprocessing of therapy. Um, a lot of veterans like this, this is great, especially if you have like not a ton of childhood trauma, although it can work for that. But I find that my veterans who, um, maybe mostly have the trauma from their, their military service, um, it's a really great treatment. We go memory by memory for the big ones. Um, but sometimes when you do one big memory, it'll kind of wipe out the other ones. Not that you don't remember it, but the pain of it, the stuckness of it, the sense that you're still needing to be in your fight or flight response goes away. You'll still remember it. You'll still remember what happened. But it won't it won't stymie you the way it does now. So it's mm. a really it's a it's a great treatment, um, well researched. Um, the next one I have is internal family systems, and what that refers to is, you know, we all have parts of ourselves. So you all have a part of you that is maybe stuck in Iraq or stuff in Afghanistan or Korea or or Vietnam or wh what have you. Um, you know, certainly that there's a, other places, South Sudan. I know we had people there um, doing some stuff um, to. Uh, get people out. Um, you know, so, so you might have a part of you that's stuck there, but you have a part of you that's a dad or a mom. You have a part of you that's a, a, a an employee somewhere. And so we, we work with all those parts and we help the parts that are holding the trauma and keeping us stuck. We help them not have to hold that anymore so that we can really go back into the fullness of who we are. Maybe not go back, but go forward into the fullness of who we are, recognizing that we are the sum of our parts, mm. that all of us, all of who we are makes us who we are today, right? And, 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 so and that's a powerful yeah. thing because uh, yeah. one of the things that we spoke about mm -hmm. when it comes to, you know, 
like Veterans Day or Memorial Day, where we look at a veteran and we thank them for their service, there is a notion uh, that Lisa actually shared that I thought you know was interesting, where a lot of veterans organizations specifically dealing with a lot of Vietnam veterans and now today even some you know more current combat operations uh, it's going from a place of thanking them for their service to welcoming welcoming them home and when right. I sat and thought about it it really was impactful because I believe honestly to this point many individuals never came home uh, you stood in a place and what came back was a person just kind of moving from project to project, object to object, thing to thing. Um, and, and it's a quick quick point I want to ask you. What would you say to some of the veterans that we work with that are highly functional in many areas, but then still deal with this? And the reason I say this is I've encountered, and personally, we have veterans that are highly educated, multiple degrees. Uh, they do very well in certain places. However... Mm -hmm they have the inability to function outside of a structure. For example, we have veterans that are like, well, I don't get a DP. I literally went and got my degree and I was well, grades and everything was great. And it's like, understand what was happening. In every school environment, it is A, B, C, D. Sure. If I do A, I get B. I did this paper, I get this grade. I do this project, I get this thing. And we operate in the military, you know, army. It's by the numbers. One, two, three, one, two, three, right? And what ends up happening is we're, we're we can operate in that groove very efficiently. Um, I would share that when it comes to work, it's like a workhorse, right? If I have a task to do, I'm going to do that thing. I know what's expected. I, I do that. Now, ask me to go ahead and go out, you know, out of there freestyle and have to do the interpersonal thing and the polit the politicking and all the things that have to happen. It's just like, well, why does DP or why does Jimmy or why does Sandra not want to be part of the potluck? Why don't they want to be a part of this? Why, when you come to DP's cubicle, you see nothing, right? You don't see pictures of my kids. You don't see pictures of uh, family. You don't see anything because I, I'm not going to give you the ability to hurt me or attack me in any way. So when right. you see what you see in my space... Um, for example, is going to be uh, general things that don't matter, right? Maybe something service or something generic, but it's something where you can say, um, hey, what do you think about this? And the question is, you know, or that's that's a dumb car. And it's like, okay, I don't care about it. I have nothing. However, right. you no say attachment. something about a kid or something you hold near and dear as a veteran, that's when a veteran will potentially jump over a cubicle and choke someone, right? So we mm -hmm. almost learn how to camouflage ourselves. So you know, I, I think this is very key where it's really one being able to come back into that present moment to the, your point of the internal family systems coming back from those combat environments, coming back from that life of service, coming back from that and being present to where you're at now and truly being able to understand that. Because now from the disability perspective, that's how you're able to truly articulate what is the disabilities you have, because there's this cognitive dissonance of Jen, I don't get it. How can I get grades, good grades here? How can I excel all these things? But this part here, I can't figure it out. It just doesn't work. Like it works for a little bit and then it just it crumbles. I try to do my own little business and it crumbles. I can't work with others and others can't work with me. What is happening here? And it goes back to the social interaction aspect that, again, back to the social isolation, it, it limits you from getting the repetitions of doing basic things. Um, one last point I'll share, and then I want you to kind of think about it or upon on it, is I remember through my therapy piece, one of the first, you know, challenges or homeworks that I got from my therapist uh, was find someone to share something personal with, right? Huh. And, yeah. uh, and, you know, you think, okay, well, that, that's easy. So it's like, no, think about it for no. a second. And I had to sit there and literally think, and one of the things that I had to actually get to the point of sharing was with a coworker that I liked pumpkin spice latte. Literally, it was something just that retarded and dumb and it was a thing. And it felt like pulling freaking teeth out of myself to be like, cause the usual Monday, Monday morning cooler thing, right? Like, hey, what do you have? What's going on? Uh, you know, what's going on? You know, nothing new, the usual. And it was just literally like, okay, let me try this. Hey, DP, what's, what, how, you know, how, how's the weekend? Uh, you know, not too bad, but it's fall and you know, pumpkin spice latte's out, so go to Starbucks or whatever. <laughs> uh -huh. And it was just like, what? You like that? And it was just like, uh, yeah, you know, I do. And it was just like, okay. And then some days had passed. And next thing I know, someone went to the store and it brought me back one, you know, thing. Uh -huh. And it was like a moment of like, you open just a little bit and then turn. It's like, 
okay, you tested the waters, right? Because we operate in extremes, right? So it's either I'm all in with you or I'm all out with you. And what part mm -hmm. of my journey was like, no, layers. There's multiple rings to the circle. Peel that's back right. one just a little bit. Um, what would you say on that? I think that's very, very impactful for individuals to really understand, you know, that aspect of that journey. Well, and I, you know, DP, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, you, you hit on a, a piece of PTSD that's maybe not as often talked about, but very, very clearly impacts almost everyone given the divorce rate um, in the army and other branches of service. Relationships, like difficulty connecting, difficulty feeling, loving feelings, um, those are symptoms of PTSD. And um, th those are common symptoms of trauma. And, and here's a piece of why, right? Relationships lack predictability and they require vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Both those things don't feel safe when you have experienced extensive trauma. So a lack of predictability, it, that's chaotic. That's like there's no structure. It's like, ah, you know, I told someone I like, you know, um, pumpkin spice lattes. And now, now mm -hmm. like anything could happen. Right, the ridicule but, of, the, of, of the location, all these things that you could think about. Right. And guess what? Nothing happened. Right, nothing um, happened, but you don't know that. Correct. And, and so uh, one, no one good one here that came out that it just, uh, Alejandro, thank you for sharing this. I not only did 20 years of active duty, but I've been in the battlefield as a contractor for another oh, 21 years. Where do I start to reestablish a normal life? And, and Jen, this is a big one. Uh, and thank you, Alejandro, for yeah, sharing Alejandro this. Because I can great. share with you that. So I transitioned from military to federal law enforcement, and I'm in the process of retiring on that side as well. And it's like we almost kind of segue into similar things, right? Mm -hmm. Like what's easier to, for Alejandro to do than to go right back into contracting, going right back where he came from. Mm -hmm. And really just the fact that you're not wearing the uniform doesn't take away from the fact of what's happening because the mind has no uniform. You are in this environment. Mm -hmm. What would you say to now someone who potentially has 41 years of being in this fight or flight environment, moving on to go of reestablishing a sense of what could be called a normal life? Yeah. And I mean, you know, I love that you use air quotes with normal because it really, it varies what normal looks like. I mean, certainly can you be a contractor and do your healing work? I think it depends on what your job is as a contractor. If you're still going over in theater, maybe not, <laughs> but you know, if you're over here doing contract stuff, um, the, the client I was talking to, um, the contract work was something in their, their air force. They do some of the, um, top secret stuff over like at Shriver and stuff. Right. So I don't know, maybe they can have a greater sense of normalcy or maybe they're, they're looking at some kind of civilian job. Yeah, absolutely. Alejandro in that fight or flight mode for 41 years. And for you, you know, that's a great thing to explore with a therapist. Like, can I find a way to get out of that? You know, at a minimum, you might consider, um, yeah, the less they know. Yeah. In terms of civilians, sorry, I'm looking at the comments coming in. <laughs> It's exciting. Um, yeah, I'm popping them up as we're going through here. Uh, if if yeah. you have questions, start populating them. We're going to start shifting into some questions. Again, this is a yeah. very deep topic, but we, but we definitely yeah. want to be able to touch on that. Cause I think Alejandro's story for right. sure. I want to go back to Alejandro. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, what, like to Alejandro's point, I mean, I think it's going to be an individual decision on, you know, can you do your trauma healing while you're in an environment where you're still in your fight or flight response? I mean, that's going to be really tough. Because to actually do some of those trauma reprocessing techniques that we talked about, IFS and and EMDR, mm -hmm. I mean, you need to have enough safety in your system. And I, enough doesn't mean total safety, but just enough that you can get grounded enough for your system to process through the trauma, right? And so it might be looking at, like, is there a career that maybe is a little more distanced from from the military, maybe it still is doing some of similar work, but maybe not still in that same level of that fight or flight response, right? Like, I think that's something I, to consider. I don't know, Jen, you know, you have to understand something here, man. Yeah. I'm, I'm high speed, low drag, and I move with a purpose. I don't want to be yeah. in a desk job. I don't want to do that stuff. You know, I came up cutting my teeth totally doing this, you know, I identify with that. You know, yeah. I, you know, what, what's the worth, right? What can I, can I realistically continue to do this? Right. Can I lie to myself? And it's a rhetorical point because at some point yeah. you have to come to the reality that who are you fooling? 
I can tell yeah. you the biggest culprit we have in our community are those that went on to do what Alejandro's done, those that have gone on to do something like law enforcement. Uh, don't want to lose my badge, Jen. I don't want to lose my gun, Jen. I don't want to lose my job, right? Jen. I have released my identity as a military person doing the thing. My new identity now is this law enforcement person, this contractor, right? So we kind of shift from identity to identities. and. You know, can you touch on the adjustment disorder? Because it's it's that yeah. constant like crap. I'm not this, so I'm here. So the adjustment from for Alejandro, you know, I would assume like many of us, it was a swift thing, right? You went from military to contracting. I'm still high speed, low drag. I went from military to law enforcement, still in there doing it, right? Paramilitary, similar things, but eventually the ride stops, and that is where now in Alejandro's case, that 20 year career adjustment disorder that 21 after as a contractor, all that stuff compounded stops in this point. And that's why I use the air quotes of saying, you know, for many, they have to come to get the skills they need to move forward, which will help you also with the claim process. But for others, even if you're not at that 20 year mark, you're literally gambling, you know, with your life trying to fool who, right? Like right. I have to come to the point where it's like this, this badge and this gun, you know, is it worth losing myself? and putting myself in a place, like you said, that is exacerbating that, because if we're talking disability now, Jen, right? Yeah. I am saying these things trigger me, these things are limiting to me, so why would I put myself intentionally in a place where I cannot, you know, work around that? And from and, for, right. and, for, and, and, and full disclaimer, I, I will say, I won't speak for others, I, I think it comes to also, you know, insecurity. Right? If this is all I've known, Jen, think about it. 17, went to service, 16, Terrifying. I made up my mind. Here we are, 40s and 50s. All I've known is all that, right? I did all the yeah. cool stuff. And now, what am I supposed to do when I don't have the skills to translate into something else, right? And that yeah. goes back to our original point of not thinking the, good, the best days are behind you, but now what is ahead of me, right? right. What, like, you what are you going to create now? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, DP, what I would say to that, what I, you know, I jotted a note to myself. It, I think what it comes down to is what do you value? What do you want? And it, at what cost? Right? Like, what at what cost? You know, yeah. I, I mean, sometimes when you have high-functioning PTSD, like Sarah's saying, thank you, Sarah. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's hard. And, it, and, and, it's and, hard. And, and I think that this is part of the journey, Sarah, uh, and for others who are in a similar predicament, um, literally, this is a conversation that Jen and I would have, right? It's almost like a mock therapy session of sorts, right? Even though that's not right. the intended point, but it's me speaking to my truth of like, this is what I'm dealing with, right? How is it that I can't comprehend that I can do all these things as an airman, as an operator, as all these things, but now people are not seeing that, right? Because they see a degree, right? They, they see all the things that we've done and that's a part of who we are but it doesn't speak to everything because we're good at camouflaging. We didn't only wear camouflage, but I would argue we truly became that camouflage. We've ingested that. We've made that part of our psyche to know, right? Like I, I know literally, like we become very over analytical and I know every conversation that I should have and what to say and what not to say, right? Because we've all done this, you know, I'll say a thing and it's just like, DP, what the heck's wrong with you? Don't say that stuff. Well, that's the line, boss. Not crossing that one again. And we start to yeah. cordon off ourselves to not say things, right? And we kind of basically live in this bubble where you have no personality, you have no thing. It's just all the military thing. Hey, what's it, what's DP? High speed, low track, gets the job done. Worker, hard worker, does this thing, doesn't sleep, doesn't do that stuff. Those things sound great until you realize that the hard worker piece means that, you know, we deal with insecurities. And the hard worker, no sleep thing means that my reality dealing with, let's say, learning disabilities and things like that is that what might come easy to John in an hour, it takes me five. Right? So what I have done in my success in life in school isn't because I'm good. It's because it's like I told someone today the other day, it's like a rocky thing. I can just take a lot of abuse. And, and, I, and I really don't want to share this because I think people don't realize that what we're, what I'm good at, again, I won't speak for others, is abuse. I'm not really good at a lot of things. What people don't ever see, though, is that what took you an hour to do, let's say, a school project, I was up all night. When I had to do a presentation at the War College, for example, so I went to the Marine Corps War College. I was among, as a civilian, you know, 
representing my, my federal agency, great, great Americans and heroes serving the country today, and the best of the best. And the feelings of inadequacy is a whole nother thing, but even something as simple as we're doing a project and the next day come prepared. And you know, people do their stuff, do study breaks, and the next day they come ready. And I literally am strolling into, you know, like a Gettysburg walkthrough, having been up for 48 hours, because I literally have been up all night trying to figure out this a basic thing. Literally, here I am in a master's program at the War College, and I'm stuck on one line because I can't understand what the word says. And I'm just literally dealing with learning issues, PTSD, sleep deprivation, and now I'm, I'm exacerbating everything in my mind as I'm dealing with this thing. And when the thing happens, oh, that was great. And it's just like, that's not sustainable. Um, and, wow. and really, many of us, right, and I, I bring this up to the part of, you know, being realistic, we're literally redlining ourselves just to maintain to the point where it's not sustainable. And eventually you will implode, derail, and that's where it falls off, right? Because right. I've understood in my journey, I'll start anything great, and then it will collapse. Because what's going to happen is there's no balance. There's no sustainment. It's ultimately a you redline until the engine blows, and that's when you get fired. And that's when the, the wife leaves you. And that's when the kids get estranged. And that's where all these things are happening because you never took time to care for your engine, right? It took time right. to look at ways to do things. Um, and, you know, it's hard to come to that, right? Because no one wants to say, hey, I have a learning disability, or hey, I have issues with anxiety, or hey, I'm overthinking something, or hey, Jen, I spent literally two hours on one page and I just finally made sense of me and I got 50 to go, right? It's yeah. just simple things like that that, you know, to the point that Sarah said, when we're operating in those linear places, many of us are high functioning, but even going deeper into what high functioning is, many of us really never show what it took to get there. And granted, we all pull old nighters and we deal with stuff, but on our side of the house, it's so much more that's happening because of all the things you're dealing with. Um, and you come to a point where you just say, I'm done and I give up. And that's why you have such a high suicide rate. Let's call it, you know, let's call the elephant in the room among high senior uh, enlisted and officers. As a senior enlisted, I got out of E7. No one checked on me. I checked on others. No one checked on me. And one of my good friends have always mentioned this, like, you know, have you ever checked on your strong friends? Have you ever checked on those people, right, looking at other people's? And, and for us, Sarah, to your point, that's like this is the language at times that is needed for me to understand, to be able to express to others, right, to my therapist, what's happening. And then when I'm going to the VA, to be able to express that to them. Because the person across the other room, the, across in front of me, all they're seeing is, well, DP, you're good. You got a degree. You got, you got multiple this. You got this. You got that. And it's like, I'm literally ready to drive off the highway at 2 a.m. Right. If, if given right. the opportunity. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, right. And I think that's a very powerful thing. Uh, what would you say to that point? That's a lot of things to say. Um, so sorry. So, I, no, it's okay. It's okay. There were a lot of things in that. No, I appreciate it, DP, because you're, you're hitting all the stuff. I mean... Right. I mean, whether you're you're in this place where, yeah, you're functioning highly um, enough. Right. But then you're miserable at miserable at home um, or struggling in a relationship at home. Right. Um, or you're struggling to function or you're like in a situation like, you know, Alejandro mentioned where you're 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 working as a contractor. Yes. And, and, oh, and, yeah. and and that's and that's that's powerful, man. Like. Again, Alejandro, yeah. honestly, I appreciate you. Right. I, I'll share my stuff because it's just easier to, than to pick on you know other folks' yeah. stuff. But this is powerful because 58 years old, and it's like my heart is there, but my mind can't keep up with this anymore. Can't do it anymore. Yeah. And yeah, and so then it's about like, okay, you know, you value helping veterans, and I hear that a lot of you do. And and or you value serving your country, or you value the work that you've done because it has great value. It's amazing stuff. You value having a job where you feel, oh, thanks, Metal Mark. Um, <laughs> enjoy your telehealth. Um, <laughs> you know, and and you value that. And some of it's like, what at what cost? You know, like at what cost do you do it? And and the cost is ultimately suicide. Or, you know, maybe less than that, but but divorce or losing your kids, like your kids not wanting to talk to you because you're so symptomatic, right? Um, this, is, this is, and this is true. Like, yeah, SSD pain is, is tough too. Yeah. Pain is my life. And this is, this is the, this is acquiring the tools to begin a whole new process. Right. Well, and much like you said, DP, this was a great way to talk about what therapy is. You know, when you're in the military, you learn skills for, you know, my, my, my partner, he was a, um, 
he's a C-130 loadmaster. He had to learn. He does maps. He had to learn how to load that mass machine, right? Like all that stuff. You had to learn how to fire a weapon. You know, you have all this training. And so, so much of therapy is now you're going to learn how to take care of mm. the mental piece of being a veteran. Fran, yeah, it's... Yeah, not sustainable. It's quicksand. It is quicksand. Literally, is. people are slowly killing themselves right. because, look, right. Janet, I don't want to give up the job. I don't want to show no. that I can't do a thing. And I guess what? It. Who are you fooling? Right. At what point is it not worth it? Um, At what point is it not worth it? Jason. Because it's not sustainable. Uh, good luck on your exam coming up. Uh, this is the, the big thing here is share your truth. That, that's the, yeah. honestly, that's the big takeaway in all this. It's yeah, being able to totally. truly just open up and share what is happening uh, there. Um, Sarah, thank you. Um, you know, she, uh, she commented, uh, that's what's happening to me. Um, yeah. Robin uh, shared after joining VHA, I, I learned a lot uh, for my claims and upward uh, and do, you know, different things there for his stuff. But beyond that, it's also just being able to get the tools to get there, right? right. Um, hit a nail on the head. Uh, it's literally, you know, our reality. Um, let's yeah. see. Rich says, you become a personality, not a person when trauma runs our background. Right? It's almost like that screensaver yeah. that's running around and you're just kind of like that movie click with um, Adam Sandler and you just fast forward into life and you're not really in the moment or there. But you're not being present with your life. Yeah. You know, that something I could speak to with that too. One of the one of the treatments that I offer, I'm hoping to actually do some online stuff, but I can hook you up with other people who are doing the online thing in your area mm -hmm. is trauma center, trauma sensitive yoga. Mm. That's a, a nice, let's, let's a nice adjunctive right treatment. Yeah, there it goes it right back to there. Yeah, trauma center, trauma sensitive yoga. It's actually um, a research based adjunctive treatment for trauma. Um, and it, it's the, the research is phenomenal on how it helps people overcome their PTSD because it gets you back in your body, right? And, and in a very contained way with a lot of choice. And whether you're, you know, in a chair, a chair is a great place to start with yoga because it's more contained. It kind of might feel more like your wire, yep. you know? Like. And, and here, here is for those as well. You know, check out, the, like I said, the Facebook page. Uh, check out yeah. her uh, website as well. This is, again, this is, there's so much here for you guys to unpack that I, it's, it's, it's powerful information that you need just yeah. for your life. This is more than a claim, people. I'm telling you. Uh, this is your life. And this information yeah. here is crucial. Uh, one of the things I wanted to share as well here is uh, for those in different locations, we have a uh, ebook that we kind of put together. And, right. you know, if you actually click or comment on, front, on Brian Reese's page um, ebook, uh, you'll get a message with this. We actually compile, we have our blog in our company. Uh, this is 350 pages broken down by all the benefits across. Uh, all the states. So nice. wherever you're at, you can find information here. Uh, again, this is a state benefit breakdown. If you go to vaclaimsinsider.com blog, backslash blog, you'll see also every state. We also have it broken down uh, via blogs as well. This information is here for you. Uh, if you're interested in this ebook, uh, comment in Brian Reese's page uh, ebook. Uh, we'll go ahead and also share that. But again, this information is here for you, so you could definitely uh, go ahead and also visit if you want championsvabooks.com or comment ebook below. Uh, we are going to have the information there for you. If you are not reach, getting help, or you haven't reached out to someone, uh, vaclaimsinsider.com is where we're at. Uh, you could definitely feel free to reach out to us there. Join vaci.com if you want to kind of get with a coach. Going back to uh, Jen's page here as well. If you want to see her page uh, and check what she's doing over there, she's at Pathways uh, to Wellness, uh, LLC.com. That'll be linked in the bio that uh, we will share as well. So we actually have uh, a full bio that, uh, blog rather, uh, that she put together with a lot of useful information. Uh, I'll actually go ahead and kind of post it here real quickly uh, so people can kind of see it. So good information here on integrative therapy so if you want this information comment and we'll go ahead and share that to you but great here information that you can research because this is a continuing conversation and we want to make sure that uh you have the tools to succeed um yeah i, I want to just really you know quickly we're going to kind of we do a five minute uh, warning here because again it's just so much yeah. good information that we could literally this is a multi-segment conversation um but for uh, Sarah, for sharing, thank you so much. Uh, Alejandro, thank you for sharing. 
Uh, I, I think it's so you know, being able to kind of really share your truth and join us. It's a huge thing. Uh, Jason, thank you for uh, commenting and joining us here. Definitely good luck on your exam. Again, Lots. be open. Uh, Karen, appreciate you. Uh, you have an emoji up, but sadly you didn't pick up the other image. So all I see is a thumbs up and a square. Uh, Fred, I was diagnosed with sleep apnea also. Again, oh. this is definitely something that, you know, things can, you know, start to compound into different ways. Right, it can exacerbate your yep. PTSD symptoms. Yep. Um, let's see here. Yeah. Um, uh, As I'm sure you're finding, Fred. <laughs> yeah, uh, getting information may prove hard and rekindle past episodes or experience from our military life. Yeah. That we, uh, again, hide those repressions and devalue ourselves uh, of the rating probably due to us. And that's very powerful. Thank you, Robin, because... That's what it is. We pack it away and we assume like, Jen, you know, like, you know, come on, you, you get it. In this conversation, no, we can't assume someone knows. Every person's uh, situation is very, very unique. Um, very unique. Uh, that's where I am and no one seems to understand me. Jesus, I'm talking mm -hmm. about myself, man. And you and I are no different. Yeah. Don't care what your job was. Yeah. And is a reason why yeah, I say, absolutely. for example, just, yeah. here, what branch of service did you serve in and what years? And the reason I ask that is for this. Because at the end of the day, a veteran is a veteran is a veteran. I don't care what your job was. I don't care what your rank was. The fact is, you put your right hand up and you made a point to say, you know, I'm going to step up and do this. Uh, and, and that's what we recognize here, right? We don't need the yeah. ego at times, especially in this conversation of what you were, you know, what your job was and where you were. At the end of the day, it's being open and true that we need this help. Um, Lisa shared here. Uh, do you need help? You know, feel free to reach out. The links are, are all in the comment section for our blogs and how to get in contact with us. Yeah. Uh, Jesus, hang in there, brother. You know what I mean? Reach out. We're here, man. Like I said, this is what it's about. Jason, uh, appreciate you. Um, well, I just want to say yeah. something, DP. I, I want to say, you know, if you're concerned about, like, gosh, you know, a civilian therapist isn't going to understand me. I mean, a lot of us are... Um, part you know spouses or mm -hmm. you know my my partner we call each other non-spouse because we choose not to be married but anyway mm -hmm. a lot of us are are with people who you know we are mm -hmm. we are living it that way there are a lot of therapists who are veterans uh rick to answer you your know? question we're yeah. going to post this in its entirety you'll see it on brian reese's page my page as well on youtube is going to be put back up here on thursday um we'll be back trust me this won't be the first time you'll see jen we have a few more things we're going to talk about but one thing no, she I'm introduced talk, is yes. the spouse aspect how do you support your spouse in this journey? We're not going to open that one up today, but we're going to come back to it. But these tools also apply to helping the spouse, right? There's a wife out there listening to this. There's a husband out there listening to this. There's a grandchild listening to this. You know that veteran. And beyond the rating, again, people misconstrue this. The rating and compensation you deserve, it's to truly regain your life. I am unable to do this now because of this rating. What really happens, it's more than a financial aspect. What I can tell you is for many veterans, Jen, um, I don't know if you uh, heard this part, but on my side as a master coach, we're running a team of coaches doing amazing work every day. Uh, it's literally a, a, almost like a validation, right? A vindication that yeah. it's not me. Like, I get it, but I have this, right? Like, it yeah. almost is a thing where grown men and women like, will break broken. down because it's like, okay, a car hit me. Yes, it was the car. I'm not the limp, it's the car that hit me, and that's why I have the limp, that's why I have PTSD, that's why I deal with this stuff, um, and for many, having that validation of, like, I'm a service-connected veteran, and something happened, and now you own that, that gives you the ability to say, okay, now, let me go ahead and get these, you know, prosthetics, let me get these tools, let me get these mental things that I need, emotional things I need, psychological things I need to begin to move forward. No different if someone experiences trauma and has to come to the point of, I have no legs. I've lost my hand. Now what do I do when I get to the position, to the place of saying, okay, now I've embraced this. Now let's move forward. Let's get those right. prosthetics on. Let's work through the pain of learning to walk again. And for many people psychologically, this is the same thing. Many of you guys have lost and gals have lost parts of yourself. And you're trying to walk around like you're not missing a part. And the fact is yeah. you can get something to help. You can get a cane, you can get a prosthetic, psychologically, mentally, emotionally, tools, yoga, things we've talked about can give you tools to begin to move forward. But I'll tell you what, it ain't easy. If you've met anyone who's yeah. lost limbs, it's not easy to learn how to walk again. There's pain and you're going to fall and you got to get back up. So in this yeah. instance, it's the same thing. Hey, Jen, this week was great. Guess what? Next week, it was horrible. I took one step yeah. back and I took two. I took one forward and two back. But guess what? Yeah. As long as you keep doing that cha-cha, 
guess what? Over a year's worth, you're still moving forward. It's, right. Can you talk about that? I think it's another good point is, Jen, I took a step forward. I came here, but then I took two back. Forget this. Well, come back right. again and take another step forward. And maybe you take right. two steps back, but eventually the forward will outweigh the back and you'll eventually right. get somewhere. Can you talk about that? Right. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of this. And I don't know, you know, all my friends, not all my friends, but most of my friends are therapists or my, my partner's military friends, right? Like those are my, those are my friends. But in my therapist circles, there's this graph that we see on Facebook a lot, right? And it says what we think healing will be. And it's, well, I should do it this way. So you mm-hmm. all, it's like, I start here and I go straight up. And then there's a graph next to it said what, what healing actually is. And it goes like this. Mm. And it slowly gets higher and higher, like you, the healing happens. But part of the healing is when you take those step back, you learn from it, right? Like, I, I got to believe that in your military service, there is something that you do that you go, oh, well, that didn't work real well. Uh, so, okay, uh, that I'm going to shift that a little bit. I'm going to tweak that. I'm going to, you know what I mean? Um, so it's, it's the same thing with healing, right? Like, it's like, oh, okay. Um, Okay, I'm going this way, I'm going this way. Ooh, I tried that. That didn't work. That sucked. What can I learn from that and how can I keep growing? But the cool thing is you're never going all the way back to square one because you already have this information that you've learned. So it's just a matter of keep on swimming, right? Like keep on going. Keep on going. Yeah, that's, you know. Um, yeah. Let's see here. I got a few more here. Uh, Dennis, thank you for Yeah, and then I'm at that. the bolt soon, but yeah. Yeah. Um, we appreciate you guys yeah. really coming in here. Uh, right, Dennis. People yeah. are commenting on some things here. Courageous um, step. Again, really, this is the beginning of many different informations. Uh, please share the Integrate Therapy movie, please. Uh, that will link the, the website. You can go ahead and kind of look into this as well. So that'll be there for you. Um, yeah, so check out the blog article I wrote that went with this. That goes into detail some of the integrative therapies we talked about today, like EMDR, IFS, TCTSY. So go ahead and look at that. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Sherry, for that. Uh, my therapist yeah, tells me absolutely, that uh, he wants me to uh, my world to get bigger for me rather than smaller. Bump me in the with whatever he saw me getting more symptomatic and withdrawals, where everything. I try to remember that, and it takes a, it's it's a process. It's it a is, journey. It's a practice for sure. Um, yep. So again, uh, yep. Rashad, thank you know you're welcome. Um, thank you, Rashad. A lot of you know comments coming in here. Uh, Je- Jesus, thank you, thank you, uh, yeah, Alejandro, thank you. thank you for sharing your story. Um, so many yeah. people, thank you all for your service. Sarah, thank you for yeah. joining us today. Um, thank you so much. Jen, if you had to give one parting thought to um, uh, a good one here, Sean shared his psychology, uh, psychology Today. Also, again, you know, look Great for resources. Great resource for finding therapists. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. uh, this is a, a powerful one here. Last one I'll, put, I'll bring up. A veteran will always be lost unless they ask their brothers and sisters for help. We all gave the same oath no matter the branch of service. When it ends, uh, some of that served is still lost. Um, and I think really that's what this is all about. It's really reaching out and helping. Um, yeah. But what would you say, Jen, to that veteran out there, that 80-year-old veteran, that 40-year-old veteran, that, that veteran who just served a few months and got put out for some condition that doesn't, um, you know, doesn't know where to even begin? What would you say to that person um, yeah. at different stages as that one actionable item of advice? Yeah, I mean, I first of all, I want to say it's never too late. There is hope we can help. This is this is healable stuff, and to just take that first step, whatever it is, you know, it doesn't have to be a huge step. Maybe it isn't reaching out to a therapist. Maybe it's reaching out to you know DP's organization to talk with a coach, or maybe you talk with a battle buddy. I mean, you know, the whole idea of not leaving anyone behind is not just apply to the battlefield, right? You all bring each other forward here now that you're home. Like, how can you? not leave each other behind? How can you help each other? And, you know, and maybe by talking to someone and sharing your story, maybe with another veteran or, or someone who will understand, um, maybe that can be your first step, but just finding a way to take that first step. And if the first step feels too big, then it's too big. Find a smaller step, but just keep, keep finding that next right thing for you. Uh, Cause you deserve, you deserve to live. A, a happy, helpful life. And I, I, that would be helpful. my point that I would just give to Jen there is, you know, find whatever that is. I, I don't, I don't, and I mean that honestly. I don't care what your yeah. why is. If your why is your son, your grandson, your dog, your, dog. your neighbor, whatever it is that gives you the ability to say, you know what, I have to try and do something to take yeah. that baby step, 
I promise you, yes, if you Dennis. take that baby step, if you just try, there are resources. You don't have to do this alone. No one told me these things when I was trying to figure out this situation. It took me five days, to almost two weeks to find someone to talk to. Now we have these resources. We have awareness and information, so we surely can do better. Um, so find whatever that is and hold on to it. Whatever it is, whether it's, again, your dog, your son, your spouse, whatever, grab onto it, hold on to it, and fight for your life because I'm telling you, we can't leave each other behind. So I implore you, if you see us, if you hear us, reach out for help. The crisis hotline, all those details will be provided in the video here below. But just reach out and talk to someone. Send me a message. Send us a message. You have the websites here. This is more than a rating. This is people's lives. And in this environment of social isolation, we can lose a lot of people, but we can save a lot of people if we have these conversations. Uh, again, make sure you check out Jen's page. Uh, she's over um, at you know Pathway to Wellness. Uh, again, that information uh, was shared here, so definitely feel free uh, to go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, we provided the link for the book as well, the ebook. So make sure to comment that uh, that information there is available to you from us to all of you, no matter where you might be right now. Um, take care of each other. Check on your friends. Yeah, check on your you. strong friends. Jen, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, Thanks for having this me. This is DP one of those things everyone. that we have to definitely come back and talk again. So, oh, um, for sure. I, I appreciate you. Big topic. For sure, for sure. So we'll be back next time. Stay tuned uh, for the next session. But thank you all for being here with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care of everyone.